The Trump administration's immigration proposal that included a pathway to citizenship for the so-called Dreamers and a request for border wall funding came at the same time that the Department of Justice sent letters to the mayors of several sanctuary cities, stating that their lack of cooperation with federal immigration enforcement could mean an end to public safety funding from the DOJ. The administration has also increased enforcement, including multiple deportations of individuals who've been living in the United States for decades, often leaving families behind in the U.S., immigration and customs Customs enforcement agents around the country raided nearly 100 7-Eleven convenience stores and arrested 21 individuals. And the agency has gained access to a license plate database with billions of records that could tell authorities where specific vehicles have been and at what time. It's in that context that we speak with Sarah Stillman, a staff writer for The New Yorker magazine and the director of the Global Migration Program at Columbia University. She's been covering this topic area and recently filed a piece for The New Yorker. Along with the assistance of graduate students, her team looked at the stories behind increased enforcement numbers and the sometimes grave consequences for the deported. Thanks for joining us. So first, thank you. Um, what were you researching? How did you do it? So we were wondering about the people who come here seeking asylum from often Central America's Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, who get deported to their deaths. Because oftentimes in this conversation in Washington, we're hearing this hypothetical that we could potentially be sending people back to harm, but we very often don't actually hear the consequences when someone is deported. You know, the, uh, the administration is going to say, we are just enforcing the letter of the law. We cannot be responsible for what happens to someone in a different country. Right. We actually have obligations under international law and under domestic law. So I think one of the meaningful things to come out of World War II and um, the international community getting together to figure out how do we prevent um, the kinds of misery that we actually inflicted on people, certainly the U.S. as a country that shipped away um, people who had come here fleeing Nazi Germany during that war. And so in 1951, we passed this refugee convention that said we will make that commitment as an international community. And we further enshrined that in U.S. law. And so nonetheless, people are both appearing at the border, directly expressing their belief that they will be harmed and sent back and are still being shipped immediately back. And then we're also seeing one of the biggest shifts under Trump has been people who've actually been living in this country for a long time, people who may have very deep roots here, who are being sent back. Some of these people told the people that were arresting them and the people even that were escorting them back across the border that I am in grave harm, it's, it's on you now. Absolutely. So I focused on a woman named Laura who had been living in the U.S. for a very long time. She had U.S. citizen children. She was driving home one night in Texas. She was pulled over by a local cop. Um, and he decided when he learned she was undocumented to turn her over to Border Patrol. She knew she had a violent husband back in Mexico who had been threatening to kill her if she was ever sent back. She literally said to Border Patrol in her last words, when I am sent back and killed, my blood will be on your hands. And in fact, that is exactly what happened. She was sent back across the bridge and a week later she was found dead. Well, one of the things that you also uh, point out is that a decrease in trust between the communities and the law enforcement that uh, serve them. In one of your paragraphs, is in Arlington, Virginia, domestic assault reports in one Hispanic neighborhood dropped more than 85 percent in the first eight months after Trump's inauguration, compared with the same period the previous year. Reports of rape and sexual assault fell 75 percent. And that didn't yeah. happen for the rest of the city or the rest of the country. So right. this is specific to the uh, Latino American population. And it's not just in Arlington, Virginia, that you're pointing right. to. No, this is a national trend. We've seen police officers in Los Angeles and in Houston come forward saying, we're really worried about the public safety ramifications of Trump's approach to immigration enforcement. I spoke to a city attorney in Denver who said 13 immigrant women had come forward to say, I can no longer proceed with my case, I'm going to revoke my wish to either get a protective order or to um, bring myself to the courthouse where ICE has been appearing oftentimes. And that's been one of the tactics that's increased in, in the recent past, is that they're, they're essentially camping out or waiting outside courthouses? Definitely. We've seen that in New York. I believe it's something like a 900 percent increase in the presence of ICE and the ICE arrests that are happening directly in courthouses or right outside of them. The administration keeps coming back to the same point, which is that, listen, we are just trying to enforce these rules. And under, under the Obama administration, some of these were not enforced. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, uh, President Obama is called the deporter in chief. So it's not just since the Trump administration, but some of these patterns you're pointing out have been going on for a few years. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think we've seen a dramatic change in both the rhetoric and the reality on the ground in terms of how ICE is operating. It's been a 40 percent increase in ICE arrest over the last year. But I think it's also fair to point out that some of these patterns were absolutely there uh, under the Obama administration. And we did see a large number of deportations then. But there was also prosecutorial discretion and clear priorities for who should be sent back. And so I think by the end of Obama's term, 
there really was a, f a focus on people with serious felony offenses, and we've seen that go out the window. And also these new categories of people who are facing threats. So we've got DACA, the young people who oftentimes have lived here for much of their lives, many of whom are now adults with their own children who are now facing um, being sent back. And we've also got temporary protected status, people from El Salvador and a number of other countries that um, thought that they were going to be here safely for a while and are also being sent. Sarah Stillman of The New Yorker, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.